Hi, this video is part of my ongoing series where I show you how to clean the controls in Newtone Intercom remote stations. Today's remote station is a model 472B and this is a fairly old speaker. This was sent to me by a fellow named Tom and he had purchased it off of eBay, which you can see eBay. He bought it to replace a speaker that's part of an older Newtone apartment house or patio home intercom system. It's like a little entry intercom system. And he found after he purchased it that it was the wrong speaker for his application. And he got a hold of me and uh, I helped him out with the problem with his original equipment. And he sent this to me sort of as a thank you for helping him out. I thought it would make a good video. This is a fairly old speaker and you'll see when we open it up uh, how old it really is. The 472B is the remote speaker that's used with the model 470 system and a 470 system is a voice only system there is no master station per se there is a 470 is actually a central amplifier which is a unit that would be mounted in a closet or someplace and it's what allows the system to operate and these are the speakers that go with it later on the 470 became the im 516 and then the later ima 516 so it's all part of the same family and actually what's interesting is all of the speakers for all of those three systems are all interchangeable. So this is a very early example. So let's go ahead and open it up and see what we have. I have my usual assortment of cleaning products. I have my Deoxid D5 for cleaning the switches. I have some Deoxid fader grease, which we'll talk about as we go along. And of course, we have a rag and some screwdrivers and things. So let's go ahead and open it up and look at the 472B and I'll show you what it's all about. So here's our 472B and this one actually is a two-piece arrangement. It includes the surface mounting base that would be attached to the surface of a, of a finished wall and then the speaker would mount on top of it. This would be used if you were doing a surface mount installation as opposed to using a standard wall housing or rough-in uh, which would give you more of a flush mount application. So this came with the 472B. I think you could you could also buy, it would be an, I think it was an IR3, which is the wall rough in, and then this would kind of be an extra piece. And actually you can see here, there's a notch in the bottom of it. And this is where the surface mount wire would be run into the surface mount base and then hooked up to the speaker. So it's a pretty clever design. Newtone actually had these available all the way through the mid 90s. And then we have the 472B itself. It's a nice ivory colored grill with gold accents. So you have a volume control knob and then you only have two intercom switches. You have a door off and on switch and then for the intercom you have listen and talk. And this speaker is actually from, if you look here, it's code dated as F66. So that would be F is the month and it was made in 1966, which makes this about 50 years old. And this is actually a new old stock speaker. It's never actually been installed. Some of the screws have been backed out because Tom tried to hook it up before he realized that it was the wrong station for his application. The other thing that's kind of interesting is it actually has an eight ohm speaker as opposed to a 16 ohm speaker, which would be common later on. It also has this little operational lever down here. So the 470 system is sort of an interesting design and the 470 amplifier itself is a single channel amplifier, which means it has only one talk path there aren't, if it had two talk paths, the speakers would be divided up into two groups. You would have inside and patio speakers in one group and then the door speaker in its own separate group. But in, on a 470 system, the door speaker is in the same communication group as the inside and patio stations. And that's why it has the door on and off button. So we'll talk about that in a second. To, to use the basic functions of the intercom to communicate from room to room on the system, it works a lot like walkie-talkies. One person pushes their talk button and calls out to someone, 
and then they release the button and then the other person pushes their talk button and answers back. So it requires two people to operate the system. If you are just talking from room to room, you just use the talk and listen switch. But if you want to answer the front door, you have to enable the door speaker. And the way you do that is you push the door switch to the on position, and then the door speaker is included into the communication loop. And then you would push talk to ask who's there, and then it would return to listen. One of the unique features is there is no talk button on the entry door station. The entry door reply is hands-free, and it's one of the first systems that Newtone made with any type of hands-free. And then, of course, you have a volume control here, which is obviously very hard to turn at this point. One of the unique things about the 470 system is there is no gain or amplification control on the 470 amplifier itself. It all relies on how the, each individual room station volume control is set to adjust the gain from that station. So it's a very simple design. They made it for quite a number of years. I think it was in the product line all the way until I think it was the mid or late 70s before the 516 came out. So it was a long lasting system. Not sure how many of them they actually sold, but it's nice to see a nice example of it. One of the things I like about this station is it has the early Newtone name on the front with the early font that they used to do. I always thought this was one of the best fonts. So this is a new old stock speaker. It's never been installed or used to any extent. It's in kind of rough shape. The door on and off switch isn't too bad. It moves fairly freely. But you can see here on the talk listen switch, to push it down requires quite a bit of effort. And when I release it, it sort of gradually creeps back up to the listen position. It should snap up immediately. And this is a problem because the switch is not dirty per se, but probably the lubrication that was put in the switch when it was made has hardened and it's having a hard time overcoming it. And of course the volume control, you can't really tell in the video but I'm using about all the force I can muster to turn the knob and it's very, very, very hard to turn. So that's not very good at all. So let's go ahead and look at the back and see what is involved in cleaning it. The 470 system and the 472B remote station are six wire systems. And you can see here what you have on the back of the speaker grill is you have the 8 ohm speaker cone here. And then you have the PC board with the switches and volume control down here. Across the top of it are the early or old school type terminal or new tone terminal um, styles, which are a piece of metal that's folded over the top of the circuit board and then a screw that goes through the face of the metal and then comes out the backside where it's threaded in as a keeper. And you have the original label across here. So these screws are the black pair. Uh, Newtone six conductor wire is three twisted pair. So you have a black pair, an orange pair, and a red pair. And so here you have black pair, orange pair, and red pair. And it actually says orange with two arrows and red and red with two arrows. One of the interesting things about this from that time is Newtone six conductor wire is an indexed wire, which means if you take the black pair as an example, you have a solid black and then you have a black with a white stripe and that repeats for the orange and the red also. So you actually have black, black, white, orange, orange, white, red, red, white. But here it's just called out as black pair, orange pair, red pair. And that indicates that it's not important to index each wire as you hook it up. Although if you were a good conscientious installer, you would do that anyway, because it makes more sense as you go along to be consistent than it would be to just hook them up haphazardly. If we look down at the bottom, you can see down here, you have the large talk listen switch here and the smaller door on off switch here. These switches are fairly accessible from the bottom of the circuit board, but the volume control, which is in this area over here, 
the opening in the face of it is pretty well hidden so I think the best way to do this is to remove this board from the faceplate so you can turn it over and have better access to it. So the circuit board is held in place with three screws. They're not the screws that you terminate the wires on but screws that go through the circuit board into standoffs of the plastic grill. There's one here one here at the bottom and there's actually one here underneath the label. Uh, one of the things to be careful of with these is sometimes the plastic that makes up the grill will get brittle over the years and if the screws are overly tight if you wrench on them too hard you can break off the standoff and that's not good. Uh, it could be repaired. You use some super glue and you can glue it back together. Uh, there also is a Phillips screw down here down here which seems to hold part of the um, body of the door speaker on off switch so we'll take that out first and then we'll remove the three other screws And then of course we have to flip it over because we have to remove the volume knob right there. So we'll see how hard or easy this is to get off. It seems to be rather tough. So I think what we'll have to do is apply a little bit of appropriate leverage to it. So if you carefully take a flat screwdriver, you can get it down between the back of the knob and the face of the grill. Try not to gouge the grill up when you do this. If you pry it up a little bit to break its seat, you might be able to get it off. This one seems to be pretty stuck. So we'll see if we can get it off here. And it just doesn't want to come off. So let's try this a different way. This is the part where you have to do what my father used to say is you have to force it carefully. So I put the rag underneath the blade of the screwdriver to pry again so I don't mark up the grill. And now it popped off. Um, it may have just been stuck because it had been on there for a long time or there might have been a little bit of glue in there. I'm not sure. Um, but we'll put that off to the side and now we can flip it over and lift the circuit board out. And we'll turn it over and you can see the switches themselves and then we'll talk about what the little lever is for. So here we have the door on off switch and then the talk listen switch. This is actually upside down. This is the bottom but you can see how they slide and that one tends to hang up some. The other thing that's interesting about this design is see if we can get it so you can see it down here on the bottom on the bottom of the switches you have these two sort of triangular tape shaped tags that come off the body of the switches and underneath them here and here are actually little springs and they're attached to the end of the tab here and then they go back up to what's actually part of the white portion of the actual switch body in here and when you move the switches you're stretching the springs. Maybe you can see it better on that one. So that's what gives the, the switch its return is when you push it down, you stretch the spring, and then when you release it, the spring pulls it back. So that's a pretty clever design. I don't think I've ever actually seen any other switches done like this. Uh, the body of the switch is kind of white, and so it's got some kind of oxidation or something I think that's built up on it. Although it feels a little um, sort of not greasy so much, but like hardened grease. So maybe it's part of the lubrication that was put in the switch. And then when it sat on somebody's shelf for 50 years, maybe in the heat, maybe it 
softened and oozed out and then got hard and that's where we are today. And then you can see on the volume control right here, if I turn it around, here's the all important opening where we're going to spray our Deoxid D5 to see if we can free up the volume control. So what you want to do is take your rag and place the board on the rag to catch the overspray. Take your Deoxit D5 and we're going to spray a little bit in the opening. And when I say a little bit, that's really what I mean. And immediately it's probably 75% better. And all you have to do is work it back and forth. Now that it moves much more freely, we'll turn it all the way counterclockwise We'll spray it again, and actually as I sprayed it, there was some probably rust from the surface metal of the switch body or volume control body that sort of flushed off of it. And then we'll work it again, and then we'll turn it fully clockwise, spray it a third time, and now it moves very freely and it feels pretty smooth. I think what I would do with a volume control like this, since it's 50 years old, even though it's never been used, is I would give it, once you've cleaned it, I think I would use a little bit of the Deoxid F5, which adds extra lubricant. It's not a cleaner, it adds some lubrication to the switch. We'll put a little bit of that in there. And that actually makes it feel better. So I like that. So that works very well now. Of course, the real test is, if you're doing this to stations that you have, how well does it improve the sound quality and how well the volume control connects as you turn it. If you're getting rid of that staticiness and it turns freer, that's a good thing. Now let's go ahead and do the switches. These are pretty easy to clean because they're very exposed. If we turn it around this way, you can see inside the switch, so the stems of the switches are white and inside the switch, the body of the switch, the moving part is white also because it's part of the stem plastic and you can see as I push this, you'll see it rise up. Same thing with the door on switch. So these are all pretty exposed and actually if you look down in here, you can see the shiny metal contacts that are placed in the back of the moving part of the switch. So to clean these, all you do is you take your Deoxid D5 and we're going to spray a little bit down inside the switch. Doesn't take a lot and we're going to move it back and forth. and immediately it's better. You can see now it snaps right back just like you would want it to. It doesn't hang up or creep back to the at rest position. It has a nice clean action. So it pro it's not because it's worn or dirty per se, it's just from sitting around for 50 years. So we'll spray a little more and we'll work it again. and that feels much better. And now we'll do the same thing with the door on off switch. And that was pretty good to start with. So that's pretty easy. Now, the last thing I like to do with these switches is add a little more lubrication to them. One of the problems with this style of switch, and one of the reasons I think they stopped making them this way, has to do with the white plastic stem, which is part of the molded moving part of the switch down in here. These have a really bad habit of this part down in here developing a crack usually right in the middle or just off to the side of the middle a little bit and as it begins to crack it cracks all the way down so when you try to move the lever part of the switch the all four sections of the switch aren't moving up and down together it doesn't make the right connections and then the station doesn't work the reason that it cracks i think is either because the type of plastic they had back in those days wasn't really very good 
are also because the stem here is so long, it's almost an inch long, that when you push it, it puts a lot of lever force on the interior part of the switch. And maybe when they're brand new, they move fairly freely. But if this was installed in somebody's house for 40 or 50 years, and they're all gummy and sticky inside, and they're really hard to move, the person using it would have to push harder and harder and harder and harder to get it to slide. And especially if you're pushing it from the end of the stem here, instead of putting your finger underneath the whole thing, which I don't think anybody would really do, if you're pushing it up from the very end like this, you're creating a lot of force, force like this. Uh, uh, uh. And it's twisting the body of the switch down in here, and I think that's why it develops cracks. So anything you can do to improve that so it doesn't break, the better off you're gonna be. So we've already cleaned it. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna lubricate it a little bit. And that's where our fader grease comes in. And fader grease is basically a dielectric jelly, and it's used in switches and fader controls and things like that. It doesn't change the con conductivity of the switch. It, it actually helps improve it. It helps cut down on oxidation and it allows the moving parts of switches to work freer. So the way you get the fader grease into the switch is you use a little plunger or syringe like this. It's a Monoject 412. And I've been using this same one for probably 10 years now. I think remember when I got these, I think I bought a dozen of them because I thought, well, you can't have too many of them. I don't think I've ever used more than this one. So you load up, it's just your standard sort of like large, it's not really a syringe per se, it's more of a plunger, but you can take the, you can take the plunger part out and then you load up the inside with fader grease. When you do this, um, you wear gloves because it's kind of greasy, and then you put the plunger back in. You're probably not gonna buy a big tub of fader grease like this. This is a pint, I think, and it's pretty expensive, but you can buy small little squeeze tubes that are like two or three grams, which is plenty for what you're gonna be using it for, and it's not nearly as expensive. I use this because I use a lot of this. Anyway, what you're gonna do is, you want to inject the grease down into the body of the switch here and you want to inject it into the side of the body where the contacts rest against the actual little circuit board part because that's the part that moves. So all you have to do is you go like this and you inject some into there and I'll do all four of them and then you can move it back and forth. Now this is a fairly long switch. The throw on the switch is about a half an inch and that's a long ways to try to get the fader grease all the way down inside. And you do have to sort of rely on the fact that as you operate the switch, it's gonna help distribute itself. One of the things you don't wanna do is get a lot of extra inside the switch like this because it's just gonna make a big gloppy mess out of it. So I can feel that that's better already. And then once you do one side, if you flip it over, you can see the other side of the switch, which is right down in here. And what you wanna do since it's at the bottom, or now what would be the top because it's upside down, is you would push this down and hold it, and that gives you a bit better access to the contacts, and then you can inject a little more fader lube, and then you work it back and forth. And you can immediately feel when you do that how much smoother it operates, how the action of the switch is, sort of get it distributed around evenly and although I know you have to be somewhat hardcore to do this if you're doing it at a customer's house they will appreciate the attention to detail that you spend on it it only takes a couple of minutes 
and once you're done it will work a, a lot better. Also if the switches are very worn because they've been oxidized and they've had a lot of dust and dirt get down inside of them and the contacts in the switches are very rough and they make a lot of scratchy noises when you move them the fader grease help fader grease helps mask that somewhat. So we'll do the door on and off. The door on and off is not as critical because it's only two contacts and it's not really communication per se. It's just activating part of the system. So there's one side and now I'll do the other side. And that feels very good also. We'll clean out the little bit of excess. And we seem to be in pretty good shape. So the last thing we'll talk about is this little lever right here. And I think actually I'll show you here what it does and then I'll show you when we put the speaker back together how you use it. So this is again the door on off switch and this is the talk listen switch. So if you push the talk listen switch down to the talk position and then you move the metal lever over the little ear in it, it has a notch and then the ear at the top here, it wraps around the top of the switch. You can see how it moves across the top and it holds the switch into the talk position. That's what it does. And I'll show you why once I put it back together. Okay, so I've put the three mounting screws back through the board so it's the circuit board is reattached to the back of the speaker grill. I put the one little Phillips screw down here where it was originally to hold the bottom of the door on off uh, switch in place. And we'll go ahead and turn it over. And the last thing to do before I show you about the lever on the bottom is we need to put the knob back on. Now, this is a small but important point. The knob has a little indexing tab on it right there, right here. You can see it. And that should correspond, if it's in the fully loud position it should correspond with this marking on the grill here and if it's turned all the way off it should correspond with this one so since the off position is labeled as off i would consider that to be the primary indexing point so you should turn the volume control shaft all the way counterclockwise and then line up the knob with the indexing mark and push it back in place. And now when we turn it up, it stops at the full mark and when we turn it down, it stops at the off mark so it's indexed correctly. It's important, it's a small thing, but it's an important thing because if someone's using the system and they want to accurately adjust the volume on a particular station, it should correspond with the actual percentage of rotation. You know, it shouldn't be at half and then be in the off position. It should actually line up correctly. So it's a small thing, but I think it's an important thing to do. So the last part is the lever on the bottom. As I showed you before, it when you push the listen talk switch down and you push the lever over, it holds the switch in the talk position like that. And this is actually the way that they achieved being able to put a remote station in a monitoring position. Let's say this speaker was in the baby's room and you put the baby down for a nap, but you want to hear if the baby wakes up and cries, you can put the speaker in the baby's room in the talk lock position or a monitoring position. And then if you're in the kitchen or another part of the house and the baby wakes up and cry, you'll hear it through the other stations. And that's what that was for. Later on, in later versions of this type of station for these types of systems, there was a different button arrangement and there was a button that was called talk lock. And so it wasn't a mechanical switch, it was actually a self-locking push button switch. So 
That's it. So those are the ins and outs of cleaning the controls on a Newton 472 remote intercom station. I hope you found this video to be interesting and perhaps helpful. If you did, please give it a thumbs up on YouTube. If you enjoy our videos and they help you out and you learn something from them, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Ra subscribing to our channel raises our search rankings on YouTube and then more people can find our videos. That's all for today. See you on the next video.